Welcome to Know This Live, where we dive into the news you need with the experts in the know. I'm Zinclair Samoa. There are a record number of women, Black, Latinx, and LGBTQ plus Americans in this new class of lawmakers. And together, they represent the most diverse group elected to Congress ever. With Democrats having control of the House and the upper hand in the Senate, they're set to work with the new Biden administration on his priorities going forward. One representative in particular is historic on multiple fronts. Democrats Representative Marilyn Strickland of Washington is the first black American to represent her state, and she's one of the first Korean Americans to be elected to Congress. She joins me now. Thank you so much for being here with us. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, of course. So just diving right in, I want to talk about the new presidency. The Biden administration has laid out their agenda. What is most pressing and urgent for the first 100 days? What needs the biggest progress? The thing that needs the most progress is tackling the pandemic. We know that vaccines are being produced and there have been some challenges getting them out to people. And there are two parts of that. You know, the states and cities were relying on the federal government to have an ample supply. And unfortunately, we found out that that supply doesn't exist the way it should. The other part of this too, is that there are people in communities who are reticent about getting the vaccine. We know that, for example, within the black community, because of the negative experiences that a lot of people have had with the healthcare system and some of the sad history, that people don't trust it. And so, you know, I have had the vaccine myself, the first part of it. I'm encouraging people to get it. I do believe that the benefits far outweigh the risks. And if we're going to tackle this pandemic, we have to get people vaccinated. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you touched on the vaccine hesitancy that I think we're seeing from a lot of communities of color, rightfully so. Um, I'm actually reminded of you've shared stories about your mother and how you often accompany her. Would love to hear you talk about that and how your experience of the need for culturally competent health care might translate to policy now that you're in office. No, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, if we think about the healthcare system itself, there are many parts of it from hospitals to clinics and also to long-term care and nursing homes. And so as we think about the cultural competency, it's important to have people in the healthcare profession at all levels who understand that different people from different cultures just react differently to illness, to getting medication, all those things. I think another thing that's important too is, you know, as we look at how we are educating people to go into healthcare field. We need more people of color who are nurses and doctors and practitioners. And so there's an equity issue around the entire healthcare system, but more importantly, how do people who work in the system who may not be from communities of color interacting with people of color and being, as you said, culturally conscious? Absolutely, absolutely. And we know that one of the Biden administration's key policies um, and initiatives is prioritizing giving legal status to millions of immigrants and just generally expediting the process of citizenship. How important um, do you think this is? And is there going to be enough support? Because obviously this stands in stark contrast to what we saw from the Trump administration. Uh, and yet it seems that this administration is really prioritizing people of color. Yeah, I mean, the xenophobia from the Trump administration has hurt us in so many ways. It's hurt us as a nation. It's hurt our social fabric. It has hurt tourism, it has hurt business. And so as we look at the Biden administration, the idea of inclusivity and allowing people to get a path to citizenship is incredibly important. And so I fully support that. And the case I will make to people who oppose it is that yes, it's the morally right thing to do, but it is essential if we're going to have an economic recovery that is inclusive. And to be honest with you, as strong as possible. Yes, yes. And, you know, I'd be remiss, of course, you know, you're now in Washington, D.C. And for me not to mention the Capitol riot, I understand that you were there at the time. What was that like for you? What was going through your mind and how has it been since? You know, it was surreal. And luckily, I was not in the Capitol building itself, but I was in my office, which is about a block away. And so as we're sitting here waiting to get the signal to vote, we're watching this unfold on television. And I will tell you that it was frightening. It was unbelievable. But at the same time, we heard the calls for the attacks coming from the president. And he wasn't very shy about it. And now he's trying to pretend he didn't have anything to do with it. He was telling people to show up and to be aggressive. But I think about imagery and imagery is very powerful. When I was sworn in on that Sunday, I wore a traditional Korean dress called the Hanbok. And then there were images from the insurrection, the domestic terrorist attack. And you saw a man with a Confederate war flag. 
And then afterwards, you saw images of people who were custodial staff cleaning up the house chambers. And you saw Andy Kim, who was one of my colleagues, who's Korean American, on his knees picking up. And so it was from joint celebration to insurrection to people having to clean up messes. And it was just a very stark contrast to think of those different types of images over a timeline. Absolutely. And you and I were just talking about how in addition to those, the staff members, the many people of color and black staff members who had to clean up the mess following the riot, a lot of the officers responding were black or people of color. What have you heard from them? What has that been like? Yeah, you know, if you've had a chance to visit Washington, D.C. and come on the Capitol campus, you know, you will see that a lot of the police officers here are African-American. And so when you think about what happened with that insurrection and that domestic terror attack that happened here at the Capitol, you sometimes forget about the people who were there trying to do good, trying to protect. And there's a story of the black police officer who actually led people up the stairs away from the Senate chamber. And so what I'm hearing is that people, some of them have PTSD because it was a very scary, horrifying event. Some people actually, they feel badly as though they failed us. And then some people just said that they were, you know, really exhausted. And so when I see Capitol Hill police as I'm, you know, walking through the campus, which is heavily guarded, I'm thanking them for their service. I want them to know we appreciate them. And even though there were some bad actors, we know that they did their best to protect us. And I think it's important to acknowledge them, especially our African-American officers. Absolutely. And, you know, you've spoken out about how the law enforcement response to the Capitol riot was so different uh, to the Black Lives Matter protests that we saw over the summer. Um, and many of these protests were spurred by the death of George Floyd. In your state, Washington, there was the death of a man, Manuel Ellis, in police custody. And while you were running for Congress, uh, you were outspoken about the Justice in Policing Act. And for those who aren't familiar, you know, that, among other things, would ban chokeholds um, and just create a standard for excessive use to force what that means and what that stands for. What's that looking like in the Senate in terms of being passed? Well, now that Georgia has flipped blue and the Senate is not controlled by Mitch McConnell, there is a better chance of it passing. But, you know, if you look at the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, there's nothing radical about it. It has some simple policy prescriptions that will hold people more accountable and at the same time allow police officers to do the job they were meant to do. As a former mayor, I am acutely aware that policing is a very local issue, but the federal government has a role to support local communities as they define what it means to have a safe community, as they talk about wanting to invest more in social services and mental health services so that police officers can focus on public safety and other people can supplement the work and help those who need it most. But, you know, it's going to be a challenge, but I do believe that the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act can help supplement the work that's happening in local government. Absolutely. And I know that you've been very involved with a lot of that work. You've called uh, in many cases for police departments around the country that they should have body cameras. And it's interesting that I think a common counter argument to that is, well, it's an expensive tool to implement. And as you mentioned, you know, you were a uh, mayor and have worked in local governments. You were the mayor of Tacoma. How do you reconcile those two things, that tension, that pushback? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult because every community is different. And I do believe, however, that body cameras are good. And to be honest with you, I know police officers who want them because it holds everyone accountable because now you have a video. And so even though people will say it's expensive, the part that's expensive is the back end, the data collection, the storage, and having to hire people to retrieve it. At the same time, the cost of losing lives, the cost of court, the cost of all these lawsuits is far more expensive than making the investment up front for policing, for justice, and to keep every community, regardless of zip code, safe. Yeah, and you know, your election in many ways has been historic. We talked about that right at the top. And you mentioned that you wore a traditional um, Korean American, excuse me, a Korean, I believe it's called a hanbok, correct? Yes. Yes, and it was really beautiful uh, as you were sworn in. Why was it so important for you to represent your heritage in that way? Well, you know, as a woman who is half black and half Korean, all my life I've been asked, you know, what do you consider yourself more of? And I said, I'm both. I'm a product of my parents. And I wore the Han book to my swearing in for a few reasons. Number one, you know, my mother, who is advanced in age, could not be here personally to be part of it. And I wanted her to be able to pick me out of the crowd. But more importantly, I wanted to honor her in my heritage. But I'll also say, too, I wanted to send a message. The... The rhetoric coming out of the Trump administration has been xenophobic, 
racist, and just bigoted. And I wanted to demonstrate that the U.S. House of Representatives and the government here in Washington, D.C. belongs to all people, to Korean Americans and to every person, regardless of where you come from, that this is the people's house. So I wanted to send a message about inclusion, but also honor my culture and more importantly, honor my mother. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think it's also been powerful to hear you talk about your desire to be a bridge between communities, right? You hold multiple identities as a Korean American, as a black woman. Would love to hear from you about, you know, what you hope for those two groups. I know you've spoken about how you know, racism exists within the two groups. What's your desire, both personally, but in terms of policy as well? You know, I would say that, you know, you start with trying to help people understand that when we work together, we have so much more power to move an agenda forward. And, you know, as I said previously, there are people in the Korean American community who are prejudiced against African Americans, and there are African Americans who are prejudiced against Koreans and Asian Pacific Islanders. And so, how can I, as someone who belongs to both of those communities, help us realize that we have a lot in common? We want good schools, we want economic opportunity. If we're entrepreneurs, we want good businesses, and we want to be treated with respect and dignity and not treated like the other. And so I believe that I can bridge that gap and really do some good work. And I was so proud to see during the Black Lives Matter movement that you had Korean Americans for Black Lives Matter. I thought that was a very significant move toward progress. Absolutely, yeah. We saw a lot of signage and just advocacy from many different groups. And I'm glad you yeah. mentioned schools as well. I know that you are a graduate of an HBCU, Historically Black College and University, Clark, Atlanta, home of the Panthers. That's uh, right. Go Yes, yes, for sure, uh, for your master's. And we know that Kamala Harris also received her degree from an HBCU. What do you hope for students graduating the, from these schools going forward? I ask that specifically knowing how many funding challenges these schools have faced um, and just how much misunderstanding surrounds how these schools work and the legacies they hold. Well, I think it's important for the general public to understand the legacy of HBCUs and why they were created in the first place and why they endure today. And you're right about the funding challenges that a lot of the HBCUs have had in the past. The good news, though, is that you see the federal government now paying more attention to their value and understanding how it's good for everyone to invest in them. And the other thing I will say as well is that, you know, my HBCU experience was life changing. And when you go to a traditional college, you're used to being in the minority just because of demographics. But being part of a majority and exploring issues that we couldn't before was important. I'm also proud to be a member of the HBCU caucus, which does exist in Congress, and it's a bipartisan caucus. And so as we talk about, again, education, opportunity, those are things that everyone can get behind. Absolutely. Well, it's clear that you have a lot of work cut out for you, but that you've also already done so much. So I really appreciate you making the time to speak with us. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. And to everyone, get vaccinated. Please mask up. Please socially distance. We'll get through this. Absolutely. Well, that was Representative Marilyn Strickland. Thank you again. Stay safe, stay well. And for all of you viewing, make sure you continue to follow our Now This pages. Thank you for watching. I'm Zinclea Samwa, and we'll see you next time for more news you need to know.